A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, thus should one regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now it is, of course, required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. It does not concern me in the least that I be judged by you or any human tribunal. I do not even pass judgment on myself. I am not conscious of anything against me, but I do not thereby stand acquitted. The one who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, do not make any judgment before the appointed time until the Lord comes, for he will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will manifest the motives of our hearts. And then everyone will receive praise from God. Verbum Domini. The salvation of the just comes from the Lord. Trust in the Lord and do good, that you may dwell in the land and be fed in security. Take delight in the Lord, and he will grant you your heart's requests. Commit to the Lord your way. Trust in him, and he will act. He will make justice dawn for you like the light. Bright as the noonday shall be your vindication. Turn from evil and do good that you may abide forever. For the Lord loves what is right and forsakes not his faithful ones. Criminals are destroyed and the posterity of the wicked is cut off. The salvation of the just is from the Lord. He is their refuge in time of distress. And the Lord helps them and delivers them he delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. Dominus vobiscum, Lexio Sancti Evangelii secundum Lucam. The scribes and the Pharisees said to Jesus, The disciples of John the Baptist fast often and offer prayers. And the disciples of the Pharisees do the same, but yours eat and drink. Jesus answered them, Can you make the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. As he also told them a parable, No one tears a piece from a new cloak to patch a new, an old one, 
Otherwise, he will tear the new, and the piece from it will not match the old cloak. Likewise, no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be ruined. Rather, new wine must be poured into fresh wineskins, and no one who has been drinking old wine desires new, for he says the old is good. Verbum Domini. Jesus speaks about new wineskins in order that we might be prepared to receive what he desires to pour into us. Romans 5.5, 5. the Holy Spirit is poured into us. The imagery of what happens to us when we receive the sacrament of baptism. But even more than baptism, all of the sacraments, the sacrament of charity and the Holy Eucharist, the sacrament of penance, when we have been cut off from God, the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, when the sick receive the blessing of Christ through the sacrament and grace is poured into the soul and the soul is conformed to Christ crucified. When two souls, when two souls unite in the sacrament of matrimony, bride, groom, and bride, and they confer the sacrament on one another, the sacraments are the life of Christ living within us and within the church. This new wine, this new share in divine life brings about transformation in the human soul. In Psalm 51, we pray, A pure heart create for me, O God. Put a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, nor deprive me of your Holy Spirit. And these words are from the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 36. I will sprinkle clean water over you and cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. This is the desire of our God to renew us, to transform us. In his life, death, and resurrection, the Lord Jesus restores mankind. In other words, he's not in the business of sewing patches. He doesn't do patchwork. He wants to renew us and to restore us. As followers of Christ, there are times when we fast and times when we feast. We rejoice in our relationship with Christ, but at the same time, we mourn for our sins. Only in Christianity can there be true contrition for our sins and rejoicing at the same time. They can coexist in Christianity mourning our sins and rejoicing in our salvation. Fasting and rejoicing are part of the Christian life. In the gospel, John the Baptist's disciples were concerned that the disciples of Christ were not fasting. 
Fasting was considered one of the three most important religious duties, alongside prayer and almsgiving. In his explanation to John's disciples, notice Jesus does not condemn fasting at all. He simply helps them to understand the joy of entering into a relationship with him, with the bridegroom that was right in front of them. Jesus compares this relationship to the joy of wedding guests that they should experience in the presence of a newly wed couple, a bridegroom and a bride. A newlywed couple brings joy and hope. Put this in context with our relationship with the Lord Jesus. Jesus was explaining to John's disciples that he is the bridegroom and they are the bride. We are the bride, the mystical body of Christ. That is to receive the bridegroom. He is giving us imagery of the relationship between himself and his church. In this specific gospel passage, Jesus encourages John's disciples to follow him, meaning entering into a new type of relationship with him. Jesus clearly says, that when the bridegroom is not here, there will be a time for fasting. That is, when he is ripped away. The imagery, the, the, the verbs in Greek speak of the Garden of Gethsemane and also in him being taken away into heaven as then the, the type of verb being ripped away, that's when the bridegroom will be ripped away and entering into the veil of eternity. Then there will be a time for fasting when the bridegroom is taken away. In this type of passage, Jesus is telling us that he came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law, to renew the law. And let's ponder that imagery that Jesus uses with the old wine and new wine in his wineskins. Wine was not stored in bottles as it is today. It was stored in wineskins. While the wine was fermenting in the wineskins, there would be pressure that was on the wineskins from the gases being released. Therefore, new wineskins were required. If the old wineskins were used to pour wine into before the fermentation process, the old wineskins would burst under the pressure. This kind of makes sense. The gases being pushed would push against the wineskins, and this is why new wineskins were required in the process of fermentation. There is another meaning. Imagine we are old wineskins. The new life of grace in the Holy Spirit cannot be poured into old wineskins, into wineskins that have holes, in other words. They need to be renewed. They need to be transformed, not just patched. Our old selves need to go. The old man needs to die. There needs to be a transformation in us. Jesus converts the old condition, our old beat-up wineskins, and transforms us into new wineskins so that we might live according to the law of grace. Old wineskins cannot stretch unless they are filled. When the Lord fills us with his gifts, that is grace, his divine life, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, 
the fruits of the Holy Spirit, we can enter into this new type of relationship with him. The Lord gives us the capacity to stretch, just like the gas is stretching the wineskins. The Lord is the one, by the power of the Holy Spirit, who gives us the capacity to stretch and to go beyond our limits by living virtue. He gives us the grace to overcome the weak wineskins of our lives, the wineskins that have cracks, that are deficient. Only the Lord can bring about this transformation and this renewal. The old wineskins were the law and the prophets leading up to Christ. Christ brought the law and the prophets to completion and to fulfillment and brought about the new wineskins, the law of grace and the Holy Spirit. Question for us might be, what do our own personal wineskins look like? The letter to the Corinthians says that all will be brought into the light. In other words, God sees everything. Only by faith and repentance can the Lord transform the old into the new. Sometimes that begins with a very good confession. If you've been away from confession for a while. Today is First Friday, and so it gives us a particular attention to the sacred heart of Jesus. His sacred humanity is the new wineskin that the fullness of God resides bodily. In the late 1600s, a nun in pre le France, began to receive revelations from Jesus about his love and that his love was a consuming fire and that he desired that his love be given to souls, that they might be transformed, and that souls might approach this burning furnace of charity. And for over a year, Jesus would reveal the love contained in his sacred heart to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque. Our Lord taught her by her own love for him and his heart that she could make reparation for all of the indifference, ingratitude, irreverence, sacrilege being committed in the world. Now, what does this mean practically? By our love for Jesus, by our fervent love of him, we make reparation for damage, for sin in the world. By coming before the Lord in all sincerity, in opening up your heart and asking for transformation, God is pleased. God desires to renew your wineskin. God desires not simply to just patch the holes like we would sometimes what rather do, not put in the hard work and effort of conversion and transformation, but he desires change, reparation. Again, this reparation for the coldness and ingratitude of the world. And by receiving Holy Communion, he would tell her, on first Fridays, especially the nine first Friday devotion, with loving devotion that we praise and thanks God, thank, give thanksgiving to God and adoration to God for all of the praises that is due to him as God. 
Jesus revealed to her how he pained when he was received in the sacrament of his love in the Holy Eucharist, when people receive him with indifference, irreverence, sacrilege, coldness, and even scorn. It's amazing to think that people would receive him with coldness and indifference, sacrilege, and even scorn. That is hatred. Not accusing anybody here this morning of doing that. But this happens. This happens. And by our love, by our love, by everybody in this church this morning, making reparation and receiving the Lord God with love and asking him to renew that love within you. You make reparation for all of the indifference in the world. for all of even sacrilege committed in the world against the Holy Eucharist. When we receive Holy Communion today and every Holy Communion of our life, may we receive with all of the love and devotion that we can possibly muster, making room for the bridegroom Jesus who doesn't want to do merely patchwork, but he wants to renew us and to fill us with his divine love, with his own heart, that we may love him back with the love that he has put in us. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us.